right. Great singing this morning. I like that new song. That's growing up. That's the second time I've heard it this morning, and I like it better the second time than the first time. If you would turn in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is our last Sunday on our series in marriage. And I will remind you that these are biblical principles. If you're with us this morning and you're not wearing a ring on your finger, that's all right. This still applies to you and relationships. Uh, these, this is useful to each one of us, but certainly when we talk about love being a priority in our life, that needs to first and foremost manifest itself in our marriages. Let me briefly walk where we've been here over the last three weeks. Uh, Proverbs 4.23 is where we started, which says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of our lives. We talked about uh, guarding our hearts against those things which would lead it in uh, unhealthy directions. We talked about the importance of leading our heart, not chasing after it uh, wherever it would lead us. In fact, just, just since I preached that just three weeks ago, I've been amazed because I've been sensitive to it now. At, at how many times and from how many places, radio, television, um, uh, the internet, all these different places where I have just constantly heard that message from our culture, just follow your heart, just do whatever feels right. Uh, it is so pervasive, uh, but God says not for Christians. Well, we are to lead our hearts uh, in the ways of God, and we will be rewarded for that, uh, for that protection. Then we talked... Uh, uh, Proverbs 12, 18, about communication, reckless words, piercing like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And we talked about the importance of, in our marriages, using communication and words uh, that build each other up. Uh, God's intent for our marriages is that they would be fulfilling, that they would be filled with joy, that we would be on the same team. Uh, but that can only happen if we have healthy communication in our marriages. And if we're tearing each other down... Uh, we're, we're going to make our lives miserable. You cannot have a happy marriage uh, when we're constantly tearing each other down. So we chose to use words that are building each other up, just like we're commanded to do in the church. Uh, last week, we talked about Proverbs 24, 16, which says, Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. We never give up in our marriages, even when we stumble, when we fail, when we fall. Uh, it's never over. We, we never give up. We continue to try again and try again. And we saw the example in Scripture of, of Jacob and Leah, just a, probably one of the worst marriages you could think of, uh, where God brought healing and brought them through a journey uh, where that was a happy and fulfilling, uh, from all appearances, by the end, that marriage was a rewarding marriage. So if God can do it there, He can certainly do that for any of us here. So we never give up on our marriages. Uh, today, I want to take you to Proverbs 27, 19, and I have, I have to turn there. Uh, 27, 19, let me read this one to you. As water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. And certainly, so a woman's heart reflects the woman. As, as you would look into still waters and see your reflection, as you would look into a mirror and see your reflection, so our hearts reveal our true identity. Well, today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to examine what the Bible says about real love. And we're just going to use this as a checklist. We're going to check the gauges in our own heart. And, and let me remind you again of the importance. This is not a checklist for you uh, to check your mate's heart with. Uh, this is for you to do some internal examination. And I think this morning, if you let the Lord work a little bit, and you put those boundaries down and barriers down, you just let the Lord uh, use his word to, to poke around a little bit and see how things are going. You're going to find some opportunities um, to improve and work on our love for our spouse. So let me, let me read this passage to you. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perse perseveres. Love never fails. 
That's a small little passage, but there's so much cram in there. So we're going to run today through this. And I'm going to have you, I hope you have your Bibles. I'm going to have you all over the place in your Bibles uh, as we run through some of this. But we're going to keep the pace moving just because of time. Now before we start, uh, I want to show a quick video. Uh, this is of some couples uh, who have endured the test of time. Uh, some of them married 40, 50 years plus on here. And they're just giving a little glimpse of what their story is looks like, and, and that's the goal here as we teach through this, we want marriages to last. So let's, let's hear some wisdom from uh, their perspective. I hope you enjoy this, and then we'll get into our text. I was sitting with my friend Arthur Kornblum in a restaurant. It was a horn and dotted cafeteria, and this beautiful girl walked in, and I turned to Arthur, and I said, Arthur, you see that girl? I'm going to marry her. And two weeks later, we were married. And it's over 50 years later, and we are still married. We fell in love in high school. Yeah, we were, we were high school sweethearts. But then after our junior year, his parents moved away. But I never forgot her. You never forgot me. No, her face was burned on my brain, and it was 34 years later that I was walking down Broadway, and I saw her come out of Toffinetti's. We both looked at each other, and it was just as though not a single day had gone by. She was just as beautiful as she was at 16. He was just the same. He looked exactly the same. We were married 40 years ago. We were married three years, got a divorce. Then I married Marjorie. The first she lived with Barbara. You're right, Barbara. But I didn't marry Barbara, I married Marjorie. Then you got a divorce. Right, then I married Kate. Another divorce. Then a couple of years later at Eddie Colicchio's funeral, I ran into her. It was some girl I don't even remember. Roberta. Yeah, Roberta. But I couldn't take my eyes off you. I remember I snuck over to her and I said, what did I say? I said, what are you doing here? Right. So I ditched Roberta, we go for coffee, a month later we're married. 35 years today after our first marriage. We were both born in the same hospital. 1921. Seven days apart. In the same hospital. We both grew up. We One block away from each other. On the Lower East Side. On Delancey Street. My family moved to the Bronx we when I was born. Hers moved when she was I lived on 183rd Street. For six years she worked on the 15th I worked for a floor. Very prominent. As a nurse, where I had a practice on the 14th floor, the very same we building. Never met. Never met. Can you imagine that? You know where we met? In an elevator. I was visiting. In the Ambassador Hotel in Chicago. He was on the third floor. I was on the twelfth. I rode up nine extra floors just to keep talking to him. Nine extra floors. <laughs> uh, he was a head counselor at the boys' camp, and I was a head counselor at the girls' camp. And they had a social one night, and he walked across the room. I thought he was coming to talk to my friend Maxine. Because people were always crossing rooms to talk to Maxine. But he was coming to talk to me. And he said, I'm Ben Small of the Coney Island Smalls. At that moment, I knew. I knew the way you know about a good melon. <laughs> and said, I found a nice girl for you. She lives in the next village. And she is ready for marriage. We were not supposed to meet until the wedding. But I wanted to make sure. So I sneaked into her village, hid behind a tree, watched her washing the clothes. I think if I don't like the way she looks, I don't marry her. But she looked very really nice to me. So I said, okay, we can marry. We married for 55 years. Neat stories and neat personalities coming out after 50 plus years of marriage. I'm always fascinated by other cultures 
Uh, here we have someone who, uh, they met for the first time, pretty much on their wedding day, and 55 years later, uh, there they are. Uh, a really, really unique story there. So this is what we're shooting for here at Cornerstone. I hope to see each of us uh, looking crazy like that after 50 years of marriage. Uh, but telling our story, we hung in there, it was worth it, we love each other, we've got a story, it wasn't always easy, but here we are, we kept our promise uh, to each other. Uh, that's God's will for your marriage. Uh, God's will for your marriage is not only that it succeeds, but that it thrives. God wants you to have a joyous marriage, and this was His idea. Uh, so let's go to our text again here, and I'm going to just walk you through this quickly. <coughs> Because we want to pick apart a little bit uh, each of these phrases and use it as a checklist. Where's my heart on this? Starting in verse 4, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. I'm going to have you hold your place in this uh, chapter. And uh, if you could go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Ephesians 4, 2. And hold your place here. We're going to go back and forth a couple times. It says in Ephesians 4, 2, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now when it comes to patience, let's just be honest. Uh, we could all use just a little more patience with one another. That is a challenging virtue. There's, there's no one here that I believe has arrived in patience. And especially in marriage and in families, patience is a challenge. But what I also want you to understand is patience is a choice, okay? We choose to be patient. Uh, it, is, it has been said, or America, uh, patience has been defined uh, as responding in a positive way to a negative situation. Being able to uh, listen to things through and, and, be, uh, and hear that calmly and be able to keep that internal calm when there's an external storm. Okay, so that's, that is the quality of, of patience. So let me give you just a quick self-diagnosis, okay? I want you to imagine it's time to get ready for work. You're going out to your vehicle. Your spouse has already left for theirs. And you realize that last night, when your husband or wife borrowed your car, they left the lights on all night long. So here you are. It's freezing cold. The engine won't start. The battery's dead. You're going to be late to work. What is your response? I'm irritated already, and this is a fictional story. <laughs> Can you feel it inside? No, you left my lights on. Man, this is going to be a tough day already. So you pick the phone up and you call your spouse and say, what? How do you respond to that? Let's back up a little bit and realize how big of an issue was this. They forgot to switch a button off. There was no maliciousness to this act, an innocent mistake that has uh, become an inconvenience to you. Are you patient? Or are you a storm waiting to happen now? Bring on the rage. There is no excuse ever for something like this to happen. The Bible says love is patient. You want love that lasts for 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50? We're patient with these things. We're patient. Love is patient. But it goes on. Love is kind. I'm going to have you go right back to Ephesians 4, verse 32. I was here just a couple weeks ago. But we're going to use this verse because it's perfect. It says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. <coughs> Kindness is love in action without any prompting. Okay? If patience is a response to a bad situation, kindness is the preemptive action of love all on its own. No prompting necessary. All right? uh, characteristics of kindness would include gentleness, sensitivity, uh, tenderness. You know, even if you have to say something challenging, uh, perhaps we need to get through a tough issue in our marriage, perhaps a rebuke needs to be given. I mean, th this is part of marriage. There are times when we need to communicate <coughs> deeply with one another. In kindness, we will bend over backwards to deliver that rebuke or challenge as softly and tenderly as possible. 
Now, I'll tell you who's really good at cornerstone of this that I've been just amazed with, and that's Gene Smith over here. He's one of our senior deacons, and there's a reason he's a senior deacon. He is very good at handling conflict. He is good at addressing issues in your life when he finds something that could use some improvement. He's good at in love coming to you and speaking to you about that rather than just letting it go and not caring enough to mention anything. And I've watched Gene in action both with myself and with others. And, you know, Gene can come to you with a correction or a rebuke, and you're not sure if you just got a hug or if you just got corrected. But you got it. You got the message. And that's the way it needs to be. It, our, our, our communication with each other needs to be just seasoned with that kindness. We can work through the issues in our marriage, but we can do it out of a loving heart. We can flavor that with kindness. So uh, God, again, expressing to us love is patient. Love is saturated in kindness. Uh, love does not envy. I'm going to send you to the Old Testament now, Deuteronomy 4.24. Deuteronomy 4.24. And here it talks about uh, envy, jealousy. It talks about the Lord's jealousy. And it says, Lord your God is a jealous God, a consuming fire. Well, what does that mean? What kind of jealousy and envy are we supposed to have in our marriage? And what, what kind is off limits? If God is a jealous God, apparently there are times where it's okay to be jealous. Well, let me explain God's jealousy. God is jealous. He's not envious. There's nothing I have that he wants that he doesn't have, and the same is true with you. Uh, but there is something that is rightfully his that sometimes we take away. That's our hearts. When we make a covenant with God and enter into a relationship with him, he becomes our Lord and our Savior. Uh, he, he becomes our God. And at the same time, our hearts tend to wander. And, and God communicates to us, He is extremely jealous. When we pledge our love to Him, He treasures that. And when our hearts start to wander towards other things, God says, oh, I am a jealous God. I, I am a consuming fire. I am going to come after you. Uh, not, out of, not out of hatred. I'm going to come out of you after a consuming love for you. I, I can't stand to see that heart that belongs to me go somewhere else. And that's a valid jealousy in any marriage. If a husband or wife begin to wander, their heart's faithfulness begins to stray and go towards a, someone else, well, that's a, that's a valid jealousy that you would have. That heart belongs to me. I, I'm in covenant with that heart. Uh, and you have a jealousy there. Well, that's a valid, righteous jealousy. You want what's back, what is rightfully yours. But the jealousy that is sinful here is the envious kind. You have something that I want. You have... You get to experience things that I do not get to experience. You have a head start in life that I did not get. This type of jealousy where we become jealous of one another within a marital relationship, there's just no room for it in a marriage. It's a killer. In fact, we need to be sharing in our spouses when they're able to make a move forward, when they're able to have success, when God blesses them, we need to share in them with their joy. So when we become marriage partners, uh, we are given the role of becoming our spouse's biggest cheerleader. All right, you're the captain of their fan club. You want to see them succeed in every single area of life. Certainly there's no room uh, for jealousy and envy in our loving relationship in marriage. So love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, and it is not proud. It does not boast, it is not proud. You know, love does not need to sound its own praises. It's just not, it doesn't need to be arrogant like that. Love is humble. Love boasts about others. You know, one of the things that attracted me to my wife, uh, Mandy, was when we were dating, I had people that would come back to me and say, well, Mandy speaks so highly of you when you're not around. I love that. Man, that made me feel great. That made me feel important. It made me feel loved by her, that she was even talking highly of me when I wasn't even there. That's the kind of boasting we need to do. Paul says, if I boast in anything, I boast in Christ and my relationship with God. If you're going to boast about anything, if you're going to be proud about anything, let it be about who God has blessed you with and the characteristics that they have that are admirable. Uh, and and, and that, will, that will bring God in back into your marriage relationship. Brag on your spouse to people. And, and on the other side of that coin, you know, my heart just breaks 
uh, whether I, I see it, uh, whether it's talking going on in a public setting, whether it's some form of social media, uh, but spouses tearing down their spouses, uh, airing all their dirty laundry. It, you know, Mandy could say plenty about me, about my shortcomings, my failings. Uh, she could make a, a good list, I'm sure. It would not disappoint anyone in here. However, she protects that in me. And, and I and her. Uh, we're here to build one another up. But, but to have this deep trust, it, no one knows Mandy like I do. No one knows me like Mandy does. And, and to take from that position of trust and just air that dirty laundry out in, in any public form whatsoever, uh, Christians, that is completely inappropriate. That is sinful behavior. And you are breaking the trust that you have your spouse. It breaks my heart as a pastor uh, when I see Christians doing that either on the internet or in some public forum uh, where we just begin to tear down our spouses. You know, Jesus knows the most about us and he loves us the most. And he knows the worst about us and he loves us the most. We have to have that kind of love for our spouses. Don't, don't tear them down. Brag about them. And don't brag about yourself. Uh, you just let your... That you keep your focus on, on your spouse and on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5, uh, love is not rude. Now, if we jump back to chapter 12 and verse 23, the same word for rude is used here. And it says, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 23, And the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. That word unpresentable is the exact same Greek word for rude. Let me define it for you. Uh, this is its definition. In defiance of social and moral standards with resulting disgrace, embarrassment, and shame. Don't be rude with your spouse. Have you ever, have you ever been in a home or around a couple where one is being just rude and obnoxious to the other? Doesn't that just burn you up inside? You'll say, how can he treat his wife like that? How can he treat, how can she treat her husband like that? Christians, don't be that person. Don't you dare allow yourself to become the rude partner who gives no thought uh, to the well-being and, and, and being a blessing. I mean, when you were beginning to date, you were not rude. That wouldn't have worked. You cared about making sure the experience they had with you was not an embarrassing one or a shameful one or a disgraceful one. Certainly want to continue to protect that because that is a mark of genuine love. Uh, and, and we also have to watch out for double standards in our own lives. When I meet someone new, I'm very kind to them. Uh, I, sh I put on my best, and I, and, I, and I try to make a very good connection with them. When, when I'm working with someone, uh, I'm very kind to them. I'm, I try not to be rude. I wouldn't want people to think negatively about me because of the interaction that they had with me. But how many of us harbor that double standard? We act that way outside of our home, and then we come home, and how do we act towards our family? And our spouse, if we don't show them the same courtesy, when in, in actuality, uh, they should be the first one to receive the very best of this kind of treatment and behavior. We, we've made a covenant with them. We've promised these are our partners for life, and we've promised our love to them. So love is not rude. Let's not allow that to creep into our relationships and into our hearts. Verse 5, love is not self-seeking. Turn back a few pages to Romans 12.10. Romans 12.10 says this, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. Love is not self-seeking. If there was ever a word that was the opposite of love, it would be selfishness. Okay, Love, love is not like that. Love does not seek its own. In fact, we have a challenge here because in our culture... Uh, we, we have raised this idea of demanding our own rights. I mean, that's practically a virtue in America. We take pride if, if we can go into a place of business or a restaurant or in other relationships and, and we are strong and demanding enough that we can get our way. Uh, and that's, that's almost admirable in our culture. I, I know one of the challenges, when, whenever I take a team from America and go to the Philippines... Uh, no matter how good we are uh, around one another in this country, we have to be really, really careful that we don't let the American out in the Philippines because it doesn't take well. 
Uh, other countries and other cultures are not nearly impressed with how well we can demand that our rights are met. It's not impressive. It's not a, a sign of, of a loving heart. And, and God says in His Word here, there's, there's no place for that. We're to be de devoted to one another and honoring each other above ourselves. And our culture does not praise that. Our culture is very strong and look out for number one. You can be a nice person while you do that unless somebody gets in your way and then you show them just what you're made of. That's not the way that God's Word says we are to love one another. And we, we have to watch that in our hearts. Again, watching that we don't have such high standards for our mates and such low standards for ourselves. You know, if you could fix ten things in your marriage, my guess is are, if you didn't pay much attention and you just wrote them all down, probably nine out of ten would be on your spouse. If they would just fix this and they would just do that, if they would do this, our marriage would be a whole lot better. In other words, if they were just more like me, this would work out really well. How self-centered. Uh, I've done enough marital counseling to know without coming out and actually saying that, that's what most of us are thinking and wrestling with. Uh, it's a struggle. But we cannot be self-centered. It is a destroyer of love. And remember the proverb. As we're examining our own hearts, when you see these things coming out in your marriage, it, this isn't, we, we chuckle about it here, but it, in another sense, it's not laughable. This, this is you seeing your face in the, in the reflection. This picture that you're seeing in your own heart, that's the real you. And, and your spouse has to live with that. So we want to make sure that we're making these course corrections as God brings them up. So love is not self-seeking. And it is not easily angered. Again, Old Testament Proverbs 16.32 I'm going to read this to you. You can turn there if you like. Proverbs 16, 32. Better a patient man, some translations say slow to anger, than a warrior. A man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. How easily do you get irritated or offended in your home? You know, rage... Outbursts, violence, I've, I've dealt with a lot of these things, unfortunately. There's no place for that in, in, in a marriage relationship. There's, there's no place for these things. We, we are supposed to be walking in, in God's love. And, and certainly if we're doing that, we're, we're going to be a joy to our mate, not a jerk. And, and some of us need to look at that and see where, how are we interacting with our mates. When, when, when something rubs against us the wrong way, is our mate walking around on eggshells just hoping not to offend today? How sad that is. Are, are you a gentle breeze in your marriage or a storm waiting to happen? Do you fly off the handle when you feel your rights have been violated? Again, the proverb says, uh, better a patient man, better someone who is slow to anger than a warrior a man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. There's, there's no place for uncontrolled outbursts of anger and rage in a marriage relationship. And if, if that's how you've learned to cope with conflict, then your spouse has a very difficult challenge on their hands. That's hard to deal with. And, and the Bible is very clear Love is not easily angered. So if you are so easily angered, if this is you, if you're just being honest with yourself right now and saying, God, this is stinging a little bit, what makes you do that? The, the core, again, is selfishness. It really is. When our prime directive is to take care of number one and someone seems to be invading in that territory, we're going to go to arms and we're going to take that on. You do not violate my rights. And this is what happens when you do what a, what a sad situation to bring that into our marriages. We must keep this out. We must dig it out of our hearts and lives and marriages if this is going on. Uh, the, uh, it continues here. Love keeps no record of wrongs. And I'm going to connect this to another one later in, in the list if I'm allowed to do that. With love always hopes. Ro love keeps no record of wrongs. Love always hopes. There's two sides. It believes the best. In other words, I have here uh, a little devotional uh, that my wife and I have been going through. We're rough on our devotionals. This one has the front cover torn off of it. I think that had a little more to do with my girls, but that's all right. That happens. 
It has a great illustration in here. Now, I want you uh, to see this word picture. Okay? This is how you view your spouse. And this is how this author has put this together. He says, I want you to, or he or she, I don't even know who wrote this, so it doesn't say. I want you to picture two rooms in your mind. Both rooms show a different aspect of your spouse. And you go into both rooms. Uh, the first room is called the appreciation room. Okay, this is where you were at the beginning of your marriage, before you were married, and you saw how honest your partner was, how intelligent they were, how diligently they worked, uh, the beauty of their eyes, the, uh, they were a good cook, all these different things that you started picking out and saying, this, I really admire this about this person. This is the appreciation room. This is what's in this room. And when you go in here and think about these things, you begin to appreciate your spouse uh, even more. Now, again, you are here in the initial stages of your relationship, uh, but there's also another room that counters this one, and the author calls this the depreciation room. There's the appreciation room and the depreciation room, and, and these are the things that bother and irritate you about your spouse. Frustrations, hurt feelings, disappointments, unmet expectations, weaknesses, failures, bad habits, hurtful words, poor decisions, they're all in this room. If you stay in that room long enough, you start to get really depressed about your marriage. You start to think things like, oh, my spouse is a real jerk. You, you start to think, you know, they are so selfish. Sometimes you'll even start to think, I wonder if I married the wrong person. What did I ever see? What did I see in this person? Why didn't I see this before I was married? People fall out of love in this room. If you spend too much time in this room, it can be devastating. It kills marriages. Divorces are plotted in this room. The more time you spend in here, the more you begin to devalue your spouse. Now, mentally, you have a choice of which room you're going to go into when you think about your spouse. Love chooses not to go into the depreciation room. It doesn't go there. The only time that it goes there is to pray. And then that's it. It's a brief time. We pray for the weaknesses and shortcomings of our spouse. But we don't go there to gawk at the walls and become angry and depreciate our spouse. <clears throat> We need in that depreciation room to remember that that is all covered in love. None of that has an impact on our love relationship with our spouse. And, and that's something we do whether our spouses deserve that or not. So I thought that was a pretty vivid illustration of, of how we look at our spouses. Love keeps no record of wrongs and it always hopes, it always believes the best. Where do you spend most of your time? Which room are you going into? And what effect is that having on your marriage? Some of you need to get out of that depreciation room. You need to close the door, lock it, and just stay out of there. And start spending time in that other room where we, we focus on those things. Hey, these were the good qualities that I remember. They're still there. There's some good, there's some good in this person. We can't forget that. We need to focus on that. Verse 6, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It does not delight in evil. It does not delight in what offends God. And on the other side of that coin, it rejoices in truth. And truth is a tricky word today. We have a world that is pluralistic and rel it, 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 it's uh, relativistic. It, it has, it, truth is, is a tough one to come by. And that's why, you know, in my marriage, I'm so grateful. I, I have the Bible as an anchor for truth. This is right. This is wrong. Mandy and I can come over together and we can work through things where an objective party uh, has already come down and said, this is the way we are to act. This is the way we are to think. These are the things that guide our decisions. And, and this is our compass in our marriage. It is truth. Love rejoices in that. If, if we throw this out, it becomes, he thinks he's right, she thinks he's, she's right, and who's to tell the difference? We have to have this anchor of truth. Love rejoices in that. I hope the Bible plays an integral role in your marriage. You'll be blessed because of it. Verse 7, love always protects. Love protects against harmful influences. We've already talked about that. Too much TV, too much uh, busyness in our work schedules, these types of things 
Now, love must protect against that. Uh, love protects against unhealthy relationships with the opposite sex. We, we, we make sure to set up appropriate boundaries so that we aren't getting attached in inappropriate ways uh, to people outside of our marriage. Love protects uh, against joy suckers. These are habits that get into our marriage that just take the joy right out. A lot of times they come in the form of addictions. Uh, they might be gambling. They might be games. might be pornography. Uh, you have a, a lot of different ways that this all plays out, but it will suck the joy out of your marriage, and it will destroy a marriage. And, and if we're recognizing some of those things, some of those habits, some addictions in our lives that are taking away the joy out of our marriage, uh, I'm, I'm pleading with you this morning. Uh, you cling to Christ and you say, when I leave here, it's done. It's over. That is not going to continue in my life anymore. I'm not going to allow that to destroy my marriage and my relationship with you. Uh, Jesus is the bondage breaker. He's the one that we have to come to, men and women, when we are struggling with addictions. They will destroy a marriage. We have to make sure that as we come to God, we allow Him to take those things over. We cannot harbor addiction. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Again, believing the best about others until convinced otherwise. We've got to believe the best about our spouses. Don't second-guess their motives. Believe the best about them in every way that we can. Love always perseveres. This is a military term, and, and it means to sustain the attacks of the enemy. Again, I've already said it once this morning. It is God's will for your marriage to thrive, to be filled with joy and gladness. It is Satan's will for your marriage to be completely destroyed, to leave a, a mess between you and your wife, your children, and the testimony that God had in your family. There are competing wills for your marriage. We have to persevere so that we withstand the attacks from the enemy on our marriage. Because they will happen. They are happening, I'll guarantee it. Because marriages are so important to God, because it is a picture of God's love for the church, Satan wants to muck that all up as the world watches on. He wants to make that as, as clouded as possible. And finally, love never fails. That is the, the ultimate climax to this passage. Now, I, I, want, I want to just put this in context, and I should have done this for you at the very beginning. Paul writes this because the Corinthians were so self-centered that it completely messed their worship up. That... This church was in a disaster. And Paul is coming in and spelling this out for them because they were doing such a poor job of combining their relationship with God and their beliefs in Christ <clears throat> with putting others first. They become selfish and self-centered. The same thing can happen in our marriages. It's the same battle. So love never fails. These first few verses that we've looked at shows us how love is selfless. And understand this, if you fall out of love, it means you've never learned to love unconditionally in the first place. Because unconditional love is not impacted by time, by circumstances, by behavior. Un unconditional love rests on the lover themselves. God demonstrates this for me. It says in the Bible, Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While I was completely unlovable, that didn't even have any impact on God's love for me. Why? Because God isn't loving me because I'm lovable. He's loving me because he is a loving God. We are to love our mates, not because they're so lovable, but because God's love is now in us, and we are loving people. We are commanded to love. It, it, the, the burden does not rest on your spouse. You bear the responsibility to be the lover, the one who loves unconditionally. And of course, that's the only way that love's going to last a lifetime. And if you're going to have a joyful marriage that lasts, it must be unconditional love. One last thing I want to bring out here is that love is a covenant. Okay, a contract and a covenant, two very different things. A contract says, uh, you will try this together and we'll see if it works out. Whereas a covenant is me committing myself to someone for a lifetime, committing to marriage. A contract says, 
uh, it is self-serving with very little liability where a covenant, again, is for the benefit of somebody else and it comes with an enormous amount of responsibility. A contract can be broken with mutual consent, but a covenant is intended to be unbreakable. God made lots of covenants. He made a covenant with Noah. He said, I'll never flood the earth again and kill all the flesh that's in it. He made a, he made a covenant with Abraham. He said, out of, out of your family lineage, I'm going to make a great nation. Uh, he made a covenant with Moses. He made a covenant with David. Someone will always be reigning on your throne. God made a covenant with me. Uh, and he said, as long as if, if I confess my sins and ask him to forgive me, that he would and he would love me unconditionally and be my Lord and Savior. Amen. And God has never broken any of his covenants. He is not a covenant breaker. And yet, we make a covenant with our spouse that is supposed to model the covenant that God has made with us. So you have brought with you this morning a uh, an item I want you to look at. Most of you, uh, some of you, not all of you, but some of you have this on here. It's right here. Okay, so this you you've brought something I want you to look at right now. If you're wearing a wedding ring, I want you to look at that wedding ring. <laughs> because this wedding ring represents your covenant vows to your spouse. This this is a very powerful symbol. It, it doesn't represent a commitment that you are merely hoping to keep. This represents a commitment with no retreat, no turning back. You're all in. This is a very, very powerful symbol. And it came with a promise that was before God and before public witnesses. Sometimes we forget how powerful uh, that this, this little walking illustration with us is. But this constantly reminds us that love never fails. Love never gives up. We have a covenant with our spouse. <coughs> We're not giving up. I want to end with this illustration. It was a story I read about uh, not too long ago. It talked about a couple named Bob and Sue. And they had uh, a long, happy, fulfilling marriage together. They were married for 62 years. And they had this little game going from the very beginning. Okay? It was uh, Bob and Sue would write this little word to each other. And, and nobody knew what it meant. Their children saw them do this. Their grandchildren saw them do this. But the word was this, S-H-M-I-L-Y. I don't know if that's Schmiley or Schmilly or what it is. But they would write this back and forth to each other. The husband would be taking a shower and his wife would sneak in and write it on the fog mirror for when he got out. There would be Schmiley. He would write it on a piece of note paper and he'd stick it in the sugar bowl for her to find. Uh, it, it even said at one point that she had unrolled the entire roll of toilet paper and written it on the last sheet and rolled that thing all the way back up. So it was quite a joke between the two of them. Well, at 52 years of marriage, Sue uh, was, uh, she had cancer. And she had quite a battle, 10 years obviously, if you do the math. And they, they kept their love strong through this. They continued to play their little game, this smiley thing. Well, Sue eventually dies. They have a, a very nice service for her. They go to the graveside. And don't you know what Bob has done? On her casket is this giant pink bow. And you know what it says on that bow. It says, Smiley. Well, Bob goes up to spend some time at the casket. Of course, he's weeping a little bit. And he's humming. And he's singing a little bit. And the, and the family's just heartbroken watching that scene. Many of you have seen that scene. And everybody began to retreat backwards and let him have that time with his wife, except one little grandchild came up and tugged on his sleeve and said, Grandpa, what does that word mean? What is smiley? Sh he said, well, let, me, let me tell you uh, what that does mean. And it says, that stands for see how much I love you. All through their marriage, they were investing in one another, doing things for each other, and simply reminding each other, see how much I love you. And guys, that's, that's the kind of communication that we need to have in our marriages. How do you love your spouse? Do they see how much you love them? I'm going to finish with this verse in Ephesians 5. <coughs> verses 25 through 27 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her 
to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Jesus loves the church in a way that he wants to present her to God, perfect, blameless, presentable. We, to, we are to be investing in our spouses like this. If your spouse has a shortcoming, it doesn't mean that you kick them to the curb. It means that you begin to work with them. You're praying for them. You love them through their struggle. No matter how long it takes, you never, ever give up. And just as we hear God telling us, see how much I love you, we need to communicate this to our spouses. Love never fails. You, you, of course, know from the Bible that the Bible teaches us that God is love. Love is not God. Don't get the two confused. God is love. This is a description, this little passage we just learned about, about Jesus, about his love for us. In fact, I can put his name in there, and that, this, this, uh, this is very true of the passage. If I reread this, Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. He is not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects. He always trusts. He always hopes. He always perseveres. Jesus never fails. Before you can love your spouse like this, you have to experience this. You have to have this in your own heart. We've said this over and over and over over the last few weeks. If you are going to love your spouse unconditionally, you must first receive unconditional love. You must experience what it feels like and what, what it means when God comes up to us and He says, he, he enters into a covenant with us and He says, now, see how much I love you. Have you done that? Because I don't want to send you home on a hopeless mission. If you have not received Christ as your personal Savior, you are not going to be able to love you. This isn't the kind of love you just muster up. This is why it is so pivotal for our families to have God at the center. Without God, we cannot make this work. Have you ever accepted this gift, this love that Jesus just wants to lavish on you? Have you ever humbled yourself enough to say, Jesus, I need this. I can't make this and do this on my own. I need a king and a savior and a Lord. Forgive me for my shortcomings. Forgive me for the selfishness I see in my own heart. And come in and change this life. You allow that to happen. And you watch that relationship spill over into your marriage, with your children, with your friends. It changes your life. That's the intent. The Christian life is a transformed life. And it happens through love and forgiveness. Have you ever received the forgiveness that Jesus offers? He's offering it this morning. If you've never done this, this morning is, is the time we need to do this. We need to settle this here and now. I want to be very clear with you. God is offering this right now. If you have never done this, I hope that you feel Jesus just gently knocking on your heart's door saying, I, I would love to do this in your life. If you would humble yourself enough to cry out to me. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But God resists the proud. We've got to humble our hearts here this morning. And, and some of us, maybe we've done this, but we take a look at our heart now this morning, we, we check it against God's word and we say, oh man, what happened? That's not the love that's reigning in my heart. That's not the love I'm demonstrating in my marriage. It's, it's time for us to allow God to change. We need to lay that heart on the altar and God, it's, it, God works on that. We need to accept that refining work. It hurts and it stings. But we need to let Him separate those things that don't belong in our lives and bring those things in which are His character, which are His qualities. What's the Lord telling you this morning? How do you need to respond to this? I can't just give a blanket in the application for this. But you need to hear from the Holy Spirit. You're going to go home and do what? You're going to commit to what this morning? Let's spend a few moments and allow God to do that in our hearts. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, speak to our hearts.
We are your servants and we're listening. And we want to do your will. Your word is powerful, God, and it cuts. It reveals and it judges. But with it comes your love and your promise that you will help us and that you will uphold us with your righteous right hand. We're clinging to you, God, because this is the kind of change that only you can do. Let me ask you this this morning, with no one looking around as your heads are bowed. Do you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning? Well, if he's knocking on your heart's door this morning, don't turn him away. I'm not going to point you out. With no one looking around, would you put your hand up in the, in the air right now and just say, Pastor, pray for me. I, I need to make this decision. Would you just put your hand up so I can see it? It takes some courage. Who will put their hand up? Pastor, pray for me. God's working on my heart right now. I'm not going to point you out. No hands have gone up. Christians, how are you doing here? Are you loving your spouse with the love of Christ? Or have you reverted back to the old selfish ways? What's God asking you to do this morning? What commitments and changes do you need to make? Let's ask the Lord for help. Father, we thank you again. We're so grateful that you believe the best about us that you know we can weather through this and make changes that bring honor and glory to you. Father, I pray over our marriages here at Cornerstone. Protect them and strengthen them and fill them with joy. Do the work that needs to be accomplished with your spirit in each of our hearts. Give us the victory, Father. Protect us from the enemy who wants to destroy. Lord, we love you and we trust you. Thank you for our spouses. They are a gift to us. Help us to see them in no other way. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stay.